So, a few weeks ago I made a video about color in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You can go watch it if you haven't seen it, but the basic gist was that for a frame to look good, you have to have a cohesive color palette, which means you can't have a whole bunch of bright colors on screen at the same time. I was mainly looking at the way Marvel dealt with having multiple superheroes in brightly colored costumes on screen simultaneously, so my focus was largely on the Avengers movies and the corresponding solo films of that team's members. But a lot of people had the same question, what about Guardians of the Galaxy? That movie has lots of bright colors, and yet its photography was aesthetically pleasing. How did it get away with being so colorful? This is actually a really interesting question, with what at least I think are multiple really interesting answers. So we're going to devote an entire video to looking at the colors in this movie. How did James Gunn and director of photography Ben Davis get away with making Guardians of the Galaxy so colorful? Well, the short answer is, they didn't. This movie is at a slightly higher saturation than the other MCU movies, but only slightly. Barring the infamous airport scene, Civil War and Guardians are basically at the same level of saturation. And if we pull some color palettes out of various scenes, they're a little bit wider than your typical movie, but they're still pretty cohesive. James Gunn and his crew are actually using a lot of neat tricks to make this movie's color palette seem really wild and varied, while still keeping it limited and tightly controlled. First of all, the fact that the Guardians of the Galaxy was based on a bunch of D-list characters rather than the extremely iconic and recognizable Avengers gave the production crew a lot more leeway when designing this movie's color scheme, as they were not locked into specific costumes and could dress the titular team to fit in with their surroundings. For a good chunk of the film's runtime, the whole Guardians crew is dressed in identical outfits, whether they're wearing prison jumpsuits or Ravager uniforms. This removed the massive color theory problem that the Avengers crew had to deal with, and made it much easier to create cohesion between the protagonists and their environments, but we still have the question of how those environments manage to look so colorful. One of the tricks is which colors they're using. Most cinematographers and painters and interior designers will generally limit themselves to working with naturalistic colors, basically colors that commonly show up in nature. Even if what they're designing is set indoors and has nothing at all to do with nature, colorists will generally stick to colors that people are used to seeing in their everyday environments, and avoid colors that they aren't. Blues, greens, browns, burgundies, whatever color white people's skin is, and yellow, but usually only in the form of sunlight reflecting off of things. Colors like purple, pink, magenta, bright red, and canary yellow tend to not be used very often, because they aren't colors that we really see in our natural environment, barring the occasional bird or wildflower. So, using these rarely used hues is a quick way to signify that the movie's color scheme is wild and crazy without actually increasing the saturation or widening the palette. You can see this in movies like Suicide Squad or Atomic Blonde. Both have relatively muted overall color schemes, but their heavy use of pink and purple light makes them read as being very colorful. Take a look at this landscape, for example. It's at a relatively normal saturation, but colorful is not the first word I would use to describe it. But if I shift the hue around 180 degrees, the colors are now much more noticeable, even though there's the same amount of them at the same vibrancy. Guardians of the Galaxy builds its color palette around a lot of these unnatural colors. Pink is used pretty sparingly, especially compared to some other movies that use it to code themselves as crazy and fun, but it's definitely there. There's three characters whose skin is pinky magenta, and most of the indoor scenes will have some kind of red or pink accent lighting, whether it's very prominent or extremely subtle. It's hard to see at first glance, but this scene where the Guardians are being sentenced actually has a magenta light coming from below filling in the shadows. It's too subtle to even register on the color palette, but it's definitely there, and even if you're not consciously noticing it, your brain is picking up on it and reading the scene as being more colorful than it really is. There's also a glowy purple gem, the bright yellow prison jumpsuits, and a whole bunch of nebulas and city lights. The production team also utilizes colors that would be normal on their own, but in combinations that are rarely used. The color palette of the scenes in Nowhere is built almost entirely around the combination of green and red. In theory, this is a perfectly valid color palette. Green and red are complementary and stand out well from each other. This was actually a relatively popular color combination for paintings in the Rococo period. But in modern times, that combination is so heavily associated with Christmas time that it's rarely ever used for anything else. On top of that, the combination has a tendency to make skin tones, at least Caucasian skin tones, look washed out and sickly, so most visual artists will avoid using it. The colors in these scenes are actually pretty desaturated, probably to avoid looking Christmassy, but these scenes seem really colorful because they're using a very abnormal palette, which makes the colors one of the first thing that sticks out to us. Now, you might have been saying to yourself, maybe I notice the colors more in the purple version of that landscape photo because purple is a rarer color and therefore more noticeable, but maybe the color was more noticeable because trees are not usually purple. To which I say, good point, because that's actually another factor in how colorful this movie appears to be. We've been discussing color abstractly, but the context in which that color is appearing is important. The colors in Guardians are more noticeable not just because of what colors are being used, but because things are colored in a way that they aren't supposed to be. 
As we discussed, blue and green are both naturalistic colors, so unless they're extremely bright or saturated, they shouldn't necessarily draw attention to themselves. But we notice the green in Gamora's skin more than we notice the green of the grass in the background of this scene because skin is not usually that color. We notice the blue of Yondu's skin more than we notice the blue of the sky because we probably haven't seen that many blue people in our lives. This doesn't just apply to aliens. Spaceships and prison jumpsuits are both rendered in colors that we aren't used to seeing them in. When you actually look at them, a huge amount of this movie's environments and costumes are rendered in neutral colors. Black, brown, beige, and gray. The only color in a lot of scenes comes from the skin of specific characters or colored lights. And yet, because the production team used these methods to make these limited colors draw your attention, these largely neutral colored scenes still read to us as being very colorful. By using colors that are usually left off of color palettes, and by rendering characters, costumes, sets, and props in abnormal hues, James Gunn makes the colors of Guardians of the Galaxy far more noticeable than they normally would be, creating the impression that the movie is a wild rainbow Lisa Frank poster while still maintaining a cohesive, visually pleasing palette. But even though Guardians is not as colorful as it might seem, it's still pretty colorful. There's a lot of scenes with a lot of different colored aliens, multicolored practical lights, people wearing different colored costumes, and multicolored nebulas that run the risk of stretching the boundaries of a cohesive palette. Which creates a version of the same problem that the Avengers movie spent so long trying to fix. Most of the scenes in this movie create the impression of a lot of colors while still keeping things limited, but some scenes really do have a very wide palette. Instead of using post-processing or light the way the Avengers movies did, James Gunn and Ben Davis solved this problem with haze. There are very few scenes in this movie that don't utilize atmospheric smoke. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's extreme, but it's almost always there in some capacity. Haze serves three major functions. First, it cuts down the saturation of things it's floating in front of, in the same way that post-processing artificially pulls the vibrancy out of an image. On top of this, it also bounces light around, throwing the objects behind it out of focus, having a similar effect to a slightly shallow depth of field. But the thing that gives it a leg up over artificial desaturation is the fact that it's both volumetric and practical. The further away from the camera something is, the more haze there will be obscuring it, and the more muted the colors will become. The third thing that haze does is naturally separate the foreground elements from the background, which means, even in a very colorful environment, there's no confusion about who the subject of the shot is. When we look at an image of an object, our brains use context clues to filter out anything that could be obscuring its true color. Light, shadow, atmosphere, trendy Instagram filters, it doesn't matter, we can usually see through it. If you took a color picker to the shot of Gamora, you would see that the pixels that make up her skin are a whole swath of greens and reds and browns. But because there's a red light in the scene, and we can see how it's affecting the objects around her, and because we at least instinctively understand how highlights and shadows work, our brains can edit all of that out, and even just from this image, without knowing what the character looks like in other conditions, determine that her skin is one homogeneous shade of green. We interpret the hazy backgrounds in the same way. Our eyes see the image literally as it is, and because the haze is toning down the background colors and making them clash less, that image is coherent and pleasing, with a limited, almost pastel color palette and a clear point of focus. Our brains, however, edit all of that pesky haze out and unconsciously calculate the true colors of all the background objects, interpreting the scene as a wild, unrestrained cacophony of hues. By taking advantage of our ability to automatically filter things out, Guardians of the Galaxy is able to give us an image that our eyes see as legible and controlled, but that our brains see as crazy and colorful. Guardians of the Galaxy is definitely colorful, but it's not actually that colorful. I think that this movie is a great case study in perception versus reality. The qualities that we perceive in works of art are not necessarily qualities that the work of art actually has. The other takeaway is that while certain rules and guidelines like color theory or composition grids or act structure might seem boring and overly restrictive, if you're creative, there's a lot of ways to innovate within them without overtly breaking them. I really hope you enjoyed that video. I had a lot of fun making it. I mean, I assume you enjoyed it because you're here at the nine minute mark listening to me after staring at your screen for nine minutes, I assume, unless you accidentally clicked it and this is just waking you up now and you don't know what you're listening to like it was on a playlist or something, in which case, hi, how's it going? Do your homework, it's 2 p.m. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, I assume you enjoyed it, unless you were hate-watching it, in which case go to therapy, but if you did enjoy it, uh, maybe like it, or um, subscribe to my channel um, if you want to see more things like it, or um, share it with your friends and your family and your loved ones and, I don't know, your AA meeting, I don't, I don't know what your life is like. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope to make more like it. Take care, be good, pet cats, and um, I don't know how to end videos, but I'll learn.